Hey, and welcome to my first ever narrated YouTube video. This is something I've wanted to try for a long time, so hope you enjoy. This sort of wedging is something I only really do for smaller pots, anything below 500 grams or so. For anything that's larger or a more complicated throne shape, I'll make sure that I'm spiral wedging much more thoroughly. But as the shape of these coffee cups is actually quite simple, I can get away with the balls of clay not being completely wedged perfectly. They aren't tall vessels either, so with just one or two cones on the wheel and it being soft clay, you really can do a lot of the work wedging-wise on the wheel. Once wedged up, I put them onto a plastic sheet, which I can then wrap them up with. I also spray them generously with water, which helps the outsides from drying out, which does happen. If I'm throwing for a couple of hours and I'm throwing a few dozen pieces or 50 or 60 pieces and I'm leaving the balls of clay exposed, the outside of the balls can get kind of dry and this will make centering and coning the clay more difficult. These are simple shapes to throw really, just a straight sided form which I then angle outward to meet my throwing pointer, which is what you can see pointing in on the right hand side of the screen. The throwing gauge measures the height and the diameter of the pot which is very useful if you're doing production throwing and making pots repetitively. Alongside my mirror, which is just out of shot here, they're some of the most useful tools that I use when I'm making. These simple forms only take one or two pulls to get the height usually, maybe three sometimes. Then it's just a matter of drawing the clay outward to meet my pointer and to form the rough shape of the coffee cup. Once the form is more or less there, I'll remove the skirt of clay around the base. This helps tidy up the form and it also means that when I come to clean off the outside of the surface with my kidney, I can get it right down into the bottom and clean the entirety of the walls. With this process I always feel that it's a matter of pushing the clay out to meet the kidney rather than pushing the kidney into the clay. I don't worry too much about the throwing rings left on the surface. I'll be trimming them later anyway, and also my glazes tend to fill the worst of them up too. Then I use a chamois leather to just smooth off the rim. I want them to be sharp, but I don't want them to be razor sharp and too delicate. When it comes to picking the pot off the wheel, it's just a matter of having relatively clean hands and also removing most of the slip from the surface of the pot. You don't want either component to be able to stick to the other. It also really depends on the type of clay body you're using. If you're using a very smooth one, it will tend to be a bit stickier when you try to lift it away, whereas those that contain more grog will definitely be easier to remove. It's definitely a skill worth learning. If your pots are wider than they are tall, then bats are generally worth using, but for forms like mugs or vases that have a more enclosed top, the pots will hold their shape as you lift them away, as long as you're careful. It'll also save you more space in the studio if you throw without them, as you can fit many more pots onto a board if they haven't got big wooden bats underneath them. You'll see here that the rim is quite blocky and square, which is generally something I'll always fix before I finish the vessel and take it off the wheel. You want a beveled edge, a shape that fits into the corners of your mouth, whereas a squared blocky edge feels kind of clumsy, not very ergonomic if it's something that you're going to be drinking from. The rim of a pot tells you a lot, even before you've picked it up. If it's fine and delicate, it will give the impression that the whole pot is fine and delicate. Whereas if it's a squared, thick rim, it will give you the opposite impression. It will look as if it's thick and chunky and a bit too heavy. You'll notice when I'm lifting the pot away from the wheel that my hands are mainly clasped around the base of the pot, with my fingers and thumbs spread out at the top. This is because the structure of the pot towards the bottom is a lot stronger. Not only is the clay a little thicker, but you have the base connecting the walls, so the structure itself is stronger. You're a lot more likely to distort the shape if you start touching the rim and the upper walls of the pot. So generally I keep my hands as close to the bottom as possible. But really, it depends on the shape and size of the pot. That's what determines how you remove the pot from the wheel. If it's wider than it is tall, the chances are you need to use a bat. And it also comes down to just practice and technique. I've seen people remove dinner plates from the potter's wheel with just their hands, drop them down carefully in place, and there's no distortion whatsoever. <laughs> 
how I leave the pots overnight really depends on what the weather's like and how much time they've had to dry during the day itself. Generally I'll just carefully wrap them in plastic or sling over a sheet loosely and by morning there's usually just a few that need to be rimmed and put outside to dry more thoroughly before I can trim them. I use chucks to turn most of my pieces. These are solid and I try to keep them leather hard wrapped in a sheet of plastic for long periods of time. The fact they're so solid means that they hold the pot nicely in place and also as I put the pot over the chuck it helps rectify any distortion in the rim by making them round again. Turning these is simple. All I do is remove a skim of clay from the outside. This is just a need to knit up to remove any throwing lines and just get the shape a bit tighter. Then I remove a beveled edge on the bottom. This generally is a better way to finish your bases, especially if they're going to be used a lot. If you have very sharp edges near the base and they're being banged on tables, the likelihood that they'll chip is quite high. I trim away the wiring off marks and then I use a smooth metal kidney just to burnish the clay and make it nice and smooth again. And lastly I just stamp them with my handmade little porcelain maker's mark, which finishes off this step. Once turned, I leave the mugs out for a while, just so they firm up a bit more before I attach the handles. If your cups are too soft when you try to do this, they'll just distort again. I pull my handles from a large block of clay, making as long a length as I can manage that has a nice even thickness. I separate this block into lots of little individual handles, and from one length I can probably get about 30 or 40 handles altogether. The consistency of the clay at this stage is crucial. If it's too soft, the length of clay can easily just tear off, and if it's too firm you'll have a much more difficult time pulling and trying to get a nice long length. Both pulling handles and throwing on the wheel are very similar processes I think. They both involve a very precise control of pressure with your hands. You know, for either, if you squeeze too hard when you're pulling, you'll just tear the handle away. And in the same way, if you're pulling the walls of clay when you're throwing, if you pinch too hard or squeeze too hard, you'll just distort the pot and ultimately you'll destroy it. So control of pressure and knowing the limits of what you can and can't do is one of the most important things you need to learn. And it's also one of the only things you can learn just through practice alone. Once all these lengths have been pulled, I'll spray them with water and then stack them on plastic, like I did for the balls of clay that I throw with. This step isn't always really necessary though. Again, it's something that depends on what the weather is doing. In the winter, I can just leave them on the wood, but in the summer, even just 20 minutes of them being exposed can be enough to firm up the outside and make them almost unusable when it comes to pulling. Then I take one of the blanks and I tap out the end this creates a flare and provides enough material that I can easily blend it into the mug nicely when it comes to attaching it. I then score and slip the mug just on the top. As the bottom joint doesn't really need it, the pressure you can use when attaching the bottom joint is much greater than what you can do on the top. But again it really depends on what type of clay body you're using as none act totally the same. Once the handle is firmly attached and blended, I proceed on to pulling the length and shaping the handle properly. Pulling handles is another one of those intuitive skills you just have to invest time into, but there are a few things you can do that will make your life a bit easier. First is to always make sure that you're using enough water. If either your hand or the handle gets too dry, it'll stick to the other and then you'll just tear the handle off most likely. Another factor is speed. You want to work fast, speed equals consistency when it comes to handles and if you're working too slowly pulling down at uneven pressures you're going to end up with very uneven surfaces and kind of ugly clunky handles so generally I try to work quite quickly when I'm doing these. And lastly there's pressure so when you're pulling you want to make sure that the pressure you apply at the beginning of the pull is the same as when you finish the pull. If you let up pressure too early you'll end up with a lump forming at the end of your handle and after repeated pulls the lump will get so large that your hand bumps into it and you'll rip the whole handle away. Once finished, I'll place the mugs back over the chuck just to make sure they're round again, as the process of pulling a handle can cause the round rim to kind of go sort of ovoid sometimes. 
It's important to note just how much pressure I'm using when I attach these handles. I really press it firmly and wiggle it into place to make sure the join is secure. Then I can blend in the flare I created previously, which makes the join a lot more secure. And it means that when I pull, the chances of a weakness forming right by the handle near the join is quite unlikely. You'll notice as I'm pulling that I alternate which side of my hand I use. This is to ensure I get a nice even shape all the way around the handle. I'm using the indent between my thumb and my index finger, which is sort of a quite acute angle. And it's that angle that I'm pressing into the clay each time I change the position of my hand and pull. If you were just to pull from one orientation, you'd end up with a handle that is much thicker on one side than it is the other. So alternating positions is very useful if you want to get a nice even finish. Once attached to the bottom, which is a bit easier than the top because you can really smear in the clay either side of the join, there's usually a few little touch-ups just to do. And I use just a wetted finger just to smooth off any fingerprints or marks there might be. Once I've finished enough cups, I'll place them onto a plastic lined board and give them a spray with water. This helps the two components dry out at a more even consistency, which is what we're aiming for as we want to avoid any cracks from forming where we join the handle. And that's it. Usually I'll leave them wrapped up like this for a couple of days before totally uncovering them and letting them dry out. And here's a finished version that's been Bisque fired, glazed, and then finally reduction fired up to 1,295 degrees centigrade. <laughs>